fucking live video. <laughs> I accidentally started the live video, if you are with us. Don is, Don is trying to get the screen set up. So, if you are with us, just hang out with us for a minute and be ready because I pressed the button too early. Okay, we're already live. All right, good evening, everybody. And welcome to Listen to Him, the video series. Uh, for those of you who have joined us on Sunday morning, you have already started with us. We are covering Luke 9 through Luke 24. I'm going to forget the exact verses. We are going from the Mount of Transfiguration to the Crucifixion, and we are going to follow Jesus through the Gospel of Luke, and we are going to take the admonition of God on the Mount of Transfiguration to the disciples and listen to him um, over the next, well, it's less than 40 days now, so we're kind of a week shy of, of 40 days. So I think we're down to, what, five weeks and six Sundays, so something like that. So there we are. A um, couple of things, there are some deficiencies, I think, in the Bible study. I got all excited about this because I thought he was going to cover uh, Luke from the ninth chapter to the 24th chapter, and he was going to drop in at strategic places. Um, I haven't had enough time to pick out the strategic places, so I'm going to attempt to pick out where he is, and that's going to cause us trouble for next week, and we'll talk about that at the end. So just to remind you that we have to talk about what we're going to study next week. Um, and don't let, don't let me forget, because I haven't got it ready yet, but I know we're, we're going to have to go one of two ways. So what we're going to try and do is play the video, we're going to try and do his stuff, and then I want to just take a minute and deal with the text. Tonight I want to talk a little bit about the text that we used Sunday morning, and that is Luke's, uh, Luke's telling of the... Uh, transfiguration story and what we can glean from that and if what if any clues that gives us to as we begin the journey from chapters 9 to 24 so are we all set are we all ready all right we will start with prayer gracious God we give you thanks this evening and we give you thanks for all those who have joined us those who are here those who are online those will be here next week who are traveling this week keep them safe we ask most gracious God that uh, you would bless this time together. May the Holy Spirit rule upon us. May you help us to listen. And may you give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. No. <laughs> it went off again. Hold on, I'm taking you closer. Don't let me make you motion sick. Am I blocking you, Pam? Hey, Katie, well, welcome to see the daily text, study on Lent. Listen to him, 40 days, 40 steps on the road to resurrection. I will always remember a particular Ash Wednesday from probably about a decade ago. I was dean of chapel at Asbury Theological Seminary and um, preaching to a group of seminary students, faculty, and and whatnot on Ash Wednesday. And I really wanted to make a particular point. The point was that Ash Wednesday was effectively like a fire alarm. It was meant to be a fire alarm. It was meant to be an interruption to the pattern. The whole season of Lent was designed to interrupt the pattern of sort of church as usual, faith as usual, and awaken us to a deeper way, to a deeper walk, to less of us, more of Jesus. But the problem is that the interruption over the years had become the pattern. Old 
it's Ash Wednesday again. Well, let's get those texts out. Let's um, let's let's do it like we did it last year and like the year before. And what's meant to wake us up actually is just a predictable routine. And so I thought, you know, how am I going to get this across? Well, my first idea was to pull the fire alarm in the chapel, just to leave the pulpit, walk over to the side, to say. Folks, the most important symbol in this room today is not the cross, it's this fire alarm. And all of a sudden that would go, and it would go off. And, and there we would be with Joel chapter 2. Blow the trumpet, sound the alarm, declare it fast, gather the people, rend your hearts and not your clothing. But I thought, you know, the fire alarm would show up, and that's probably not a good idea. So... I went with another idea. It turns out to be a much worse idea. I stood up at the pulpit. My, 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 I'll never forget it. They'll never forget it. The people will never forget it. I'm not sure they're going to remember it for the right reason. But there's my kids up there in the balcony. You know, they're probably ranging from, you know, 10 down to about 4. And, um, faculty, students, full house. And I said, folks, I don't know any other way to say this today. But I got bad news for you. And I'm just going to say it. I have been diagnosed with cancer. Terminal cancer. And I mean, it was gasps. And, of course, I, I, I didn't have cancer. And, and, and just to be clear on this video, I don't have cancer that I know of. But I put it out there as an effort to sound the alarm. Because I know of no other word that sounds the alarm in this day and age and in this culture like the word cancer. And I said, I have been diagnosed with terminal cancer. I could tell some people were starting to cry. And so I made the turn. I said, and there's more bad news. You have it too. We all have been diagnosed with the terminal cancer of sin. We were born into it. It has us. We are infected, and it's going to kill us. And I said, but I've got some good news. Really, really good news. There's a cure, and it has a 100% cure rate. There's only one cure to this cancer. And it's the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the mercy of God. And if we will submit to the treatment, if we will take the medicine, if we will walk the path, if we will receive this good news, not only can we be forgiven, but we can be sick. And we can live a life of the very fullness of God. So, um, oh, did I ever get a whipping for that sermon? Now, I'm sure to this day people are still talking about it, hopefully for the right reasons. But the point is we are now moving into a season. We, in fact, have moved. With, this is the very first Sunday of Lent. We've crossed Ash Wednesday, and we're on a 40-day journey. Um, it's meant to be an interruption to the pattern. It's meant to be a wake-up call. It's meant to be like no snooze bar. Let's wake up, and let's get with the gospel. So, just a little bit of an overview. Uh, just to kind of Give us our bearings. 
We're going to be in the Gospel of Luke for these next weeks. And specifically, we're going to be going from Luke, I believe it's 9, maybe it's 9.18 through Luke 24, 8. Okay, that's going to be the big swath of text we're going to. We're not going to be picking and pulling from here and there. We're not going to try not to sort of conform the Bible into my ideas and my constructs and concepts, but we're trying to let the gospel itself serve as our discipleship curriculum, right? I mean, there's all kinds of biblical things we could say. There are all kinds of points we could pull together and, and make a curriculum and make it say this or that and the other. And those things could be true and helpful. It's my conviction that the Bible is written as it's written for a purpose, that we ought to try to read it on its terms as much as possible and submit to its agenda. And that's what the daily text is for any of you who've been with it in a length of time. You know, we're just proceeding along the way. We're just going from, we pick up with one verse, we write up several verses, we have some reflection on it, some prayer, a question, and the next day we pick up where we left off with the next verse. That's what we're going to be doing with this. You know, we have a, we put this into a book. Uh, listen to him. First time I've ever written it ahead of time, okay? It's a miracle. And I hope you'll get the book. It's also going to be online. We're going to have it on our on our, on our, on our uh, Discipleship Bands app. We're going to have it in email as usual. But you'll see in a minute why I want you to get the book because I want you to, to, to journal your way through this. So, just now for a little bit of math, Luke's gospel, of course, we, you know, we begin um, with these signs that take us on a journey all the way down to the manger. This season is called, of course, Advent. I didn't almost stall her, okay, just so you know. And then from Advent, this incredible revelation of the birth of the Son of God, we began a journey back up. And this is a season called Epiphany. You can read my writing. Epiphany is this season of manifestations, like Jesus is taken to the temple as a baby. He's um Baptized, he turns water into wine. You know, he's when he's twelve years old. They're looking for him. He's, he's back with the rabbis, instructing them. All these incredible signs. It ends on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? That's Shrove Tuesday. We've just passed over. On the Mount of Transfiguration, it's like we can see the kingdom come. Jesus is transfigured. Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets are gathered. Jesus, the fulfillment of the kingdom of God, it's at hand. Now is the time. And he says, we've got to go to Jerusalem. And there begins a journey all the way down. And that's going to be the season of Lent. And that's where we're headed for these next days. We've come all the way down to the manger. We've gone all the way up to the Mount of Transfiguration. Now we're going to go all the way down to the cross. And you'll remember at the top of the Mount of Transfiguration, get this incredible word from God, really kind of frames up the whole thing here, three words, listen to him, this is my son, my beloved, listen to him, and that is our agenda, as we make our journey to the cross. We are going
going to read day by day. We're going to gather week by week. And we're going to do our dead level best to listen to him. How are we going to do that? Well, I already said this, this guy. I'd love it if you get the book so that I want you to read this book with a highlighter, a pencil. And I want you to be very attentive to what he says. I want to encourage you as you are reading this day by day. And, and I know, I know, I know a lot of you are like, I don't have time to read all this. This is not that long. Remember, we got cancer, okay? This is the treatment. Not this book, the gospel. We've got to get the chemotherapy of the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ into our system. It will not happen if we just sort of put it off or just sort of, you know, read it thinly. I want you to wake up a little bit earlier every day. I want you to read the scripture text. We printed the whole thing in here. And where Jesus talks, I want you to read it out loud. Why? Because I want your ears to hear it. The, the Bible, surprisingly, was not written to be read. Because for the overwhelming majority of human history, people couldn't read. The Bible was written to be heard. Faith comes by hearing. And when we hear, we see. You see, we've fallen into a trap in the sort of last several hundred years. We skip right over hearing and seeing because the measure of things for us is now reading and thinking. Reading and thinking are great things, but you can read and think without hearing a thing or seeing a thing. The Bible is about ears to hear, eyes to see, heart to respond, to obey, to love. That's where we're headed. So I want you to read it aloud. I want your ears to hear it. And when you hear something that Jesus says that grabs a hold of you, highlight it, underline it. Because when you come together as a group like hopefully you are today, what I want you to do, and I, I'll defer to your group leader, your teacher, but I'm going to ask you to get in groups of two or three or four, and I want you to share what you heard. Just share with each other. You know, this week in the readings, if I had to bring it down to one thing or two things, here's what I heard Jesus say. And here's what it did in my heart and mind. That's what I think getting together around the gospel is all about, reading together. Allowing the Spirit to interpret it to us in one to another. So that's going to be the shape of our journey. This is our agenda. Listen to Him. It's going to be a good way. It's going to be a hard way, a challenging way. It's going to be full of mercy. It's going to be full of truth, full of love. Listen to Him. We're on the road to resurrection. We'll see you next week. So, for those of you at home and those of you who are, who are here, um, if you read the devotional that we have sent to you, we mail everybody a devotional, except for John now, and I've got the email you No, it's a devotional, I think. It was the Lenten booklet. There's a Lenten booklet. That's what I'm talking about. When I talk about the devotional booklet, I'm talking about the Lenten booklet. So, <clears throat> what I did... With all the stuff that wasn't um, a little less than half came from folks in the congregation. A little more than half I put in. And the texts I used were the texts out of his book. So, and I tried to stay with the same theme that he did. So, if you read the Latin devotional books that I sent you, you will be doing the same thing as if you read the book, I believe. So, Plus, you also get to read some stuff from people that you know on top of that. So, um, I don't know. Are you guys reading it? Reading it? Okay. Um, getting anything out of it? All right. So, I don't know if it's fair to do this to you, but of course, his first question is, um, 
How have you encountered an experience like in your past? And how have, are you challenged to take your experience to the next level this time around? I, I'm not sure what that, I'm not sure what, what that question does. Um, I, I think it is easy to get in a rut with Lent. Um, it just, it just is. I think it's easy to get into a rut with anything that we do in church. Um, and nobody knows that better than the pastor because when a new pastor comes in, he learns where all the ruts are. I know where all the flowers have to be. I know where all the arrangements have to be. I don't know who sings when. I have to figure out which candles get lit, which things come out. As a matter of fact, we have entire committees that meet to make sure that the ruts stay in the same place. Now, sometimes you're free to change things as long as you don't move the ruts. You're free to move anything else but the ruts. So, and sometimes, sometimes ruts, ruts are good. Sometimes, I, I have people who are called by the similarity of, the, of, of one year to the next. Um, I, I think, you know, for this year, I think it's important with you folks not being in the building um, and not doing a lot of the regular stuff. I think, it's, I think it's important. But at the same time, I also think we have an opportunity this Lent to do something different. And go a little bit deeper. I, I think I think our eyes are, and our ears are a little bit sharper this year because of where we have been this year. It has been a rough year. It has been a rough year in terms of the pandemic. It has been a rough year in terms of the politics of this country. It has been a rough year just in terms of, of, the, of the garbage um, that we have all witnessed on social media. Uh, and I think we're all in a place where we're either scratching our heads, our hearts are broken, or we are just in a very difficult place. And I think that place that we are in allows us to listen. So I'm hoping, hoping that you will listen. So anybody got any expectations about how this one is going to be different? Oh, it's interesting. Expectations are a good thing to get up front. That way you might be able to hit a couple of them over the next six weeks. So any expectations? Okay. Uh, from the scores or from my progress? All of the above. All of the, if, if I know where you're trying to go personally, then we may be able to make this course and where you're trying to go intersect because we're theoretically at week one. So I expect to learn uh, have a deeper relationship with Jesus by spending time not just in the morning, but maybe throughout the day. Okay. Any expectations? Uh, help me to focus more on the Lord. My expectation is I'll actually hear something in the next six weeks. And I said that Sunday. I said, <clears throat> if we listen somewhere along these six weeks, God has something, will have something to say to everybody. Um, I'm not sure what that is, but we're all we're all about to find out, I guess. We're in trouble if it's all the same thing. That, that could get really dangerous very really quickly. Who knows where God can call us? How does seeing the season of Lent as a journey of descent, beginning atop the Mount of Transfiguration and journeying down to the cross, change the way you see the way ahead? How does seeing it in the framework of a map or journey help rather than just as a, a body text? That sounds like, sounds like he's in seminary. Instead of a bunch of verses, you know, instead of going to Matthew 4 and Spending the first, uh, you know, spending Ash Wednesday with Jesus out in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. What happens if instead of picking certain texts, what happens if we view it as a journey? And not just any journey, but you are traveling into the valley. Um, if you were in uh, Bethany in Bethphage, um, I'll give you some gold stars if you can name anything about Bethany and Bethphage. Um, it, <clears throat> yes, yep, that's the New Testament reference. There are some Old Testament references. It is where the Ark of the Covenant stops on its way to uh, to Jerusalem. Uh, but when you're when you're there, <clears throat> Jerusalem is sitting on a hill, and Bethany and Bethphage are on the uh, on the opposite hill, and they're just over the top. So you know if you're walking. You get to Bethany and Bethphage. You get 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 there, and if you 
walk a little bit farther and you hit the top of the hill. Well, most people would, would get there at the end of the day and they would spend the night because you're not gonna travel at night, but you know you're, a day, you're, you're less than a day's journey from Jerusalem. So you get to that hill and you can see Jerusalem. The problem is you have to go all the way down the Mount of Olives, by the way, and then all the way back up. Okay. Um, I'm not gonna remember the name of the valley, but um, it's a long way down. Kidron? Yes, I think it is a Kidron Valley. So, um, at the time, I guess it, was, it used to all be filled with olive trees, you know, that entire valley. There's also where the garbage dump was, but that's another that's another story for another time. You know, they got a dead had to dump their garbage somewhere, so down in the valley outside the city was, was the place. But outside the garbage dump, you had the, the Mount of Olives, and uh, there was a road that led from the Mount of Olives across the valley into the city. But you have to come down. You have to come down um, to get to to get to Jerusalem to get to the cross. Um, and I'm often reminded when he talks about being on a journey. I'm, I'm, I always I always see the Emmaus walk in here when he's on on the road with the with the folks on the, on the road to Emmaus. And I think it's it's a different kind of walk as you're um, you're studying texts. If you're walking, I guess you expect to be with you have something revealed to you. I, I guess like they did in that. So, um, any other thoughts? One thing was cleared up for me was I've always, every time I look up the word epiphany, it, it talks about manifestations, and now it's clear to me what it is. It's the things like uh, the miracles and think water into wine, all that. I, I didn't know that's what that referred to. Mm -hmm. Which was really cool because. Uh, we restarted Children's Sunday School Sunday, and Trudy looked at me and she said, I'm going to do the last Sunday of Advent. I'm going to light the last candle on the Advent wreath because we didn't get to do that because we, we had to stop, stop Sunday School at that point because of the numbers. And she looked at me and she said, this is why I'm going to do it. She said, if you look at the lesson, it's about the presence of Jesus and what he's about to do. And if you look at the last candle, it's about the coming of Jesus. And what she was talking about was that it, it's all an epiphany. It's all about the manifestation of who Jesus is. And she and she saw the connection you know, between Advent and Lent and where we're headed with this whole thing. Um, so, Epiphany is a liturgical season, but it's also a term that you use whenever Jesus manifests who he is, who he is in the gospel. So, um, we don't use that term that way because we're all creatures of the church now and it's all moved into liturgical realms. What do you make of the difference between reading and thinking and hearing and seeing when it comes to the scriptures? We would take on the challenge of reading the words of Jesus aloud so your ears can hear them each day. No. So I joined a pastoral support group that meets every morning at 8 o'clock, and, and J.D. forces us all. I mean, it forces us. We're all on Zoom. Um, he has us all mute, because if you've ever tried to do anything unison on Zoom together, it's a disaster. It just doesn't work. So we all mute. And then we all read the text for the day together. Um, now, my worship professor, so J.D. must have had, obviously he didn't have Dr. Lewis for preaching or he never would have tried that sermon he talked about. Broke one of the primary canons. You never lie to your audience, ever, period. End of discussion. You don't come close. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that Dr. Boyd would say is, that depending on how you do scripture is it, it's all going to change if you do it silently that does one thing for you if you read it it does something else if you're listening to it that'll do something else it's the same thing with prayer he had us um at different points during the class he would have us pray standing up and he would have us pray kneeling or sitting and then my favorite which was really uncomfortable for everybody in the room was he had us lay face down on the floor and I will tell you that changes your whole attitude. So 
I'm going to agree with JD. I would buck him on this one, but I've chosen to do my daily devotional with him, and he gives me an opportunity to say it out loud. Um, so, I, if I can do it, you can do it. Okay, everybody got that at home. If I can sit down and read it every day out loud, you can do it too. I am, I am a bit of a nonconformist when it comes to that kind of stuff. Um, but I am giving it a whirl for the next 60 days, or 40 days, and 40 days and six Sundays. So there we are. Did anybody have anything stand out this week in their devotional readings? Anything anybody wanted to share? I did, but you'd have to be a staff. You weren't there, so. Oh. Well, I was reading about the sheep and the goats. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why did you walk away with the sheep and the goats? He means business. Why? <laughs> <laughs> but he, it, it says, when I was thirsty, when I was hungry, when I was um, sick, when I was in prison. What were the others? There's a couple more. Matthew 25. And I passed the one on and attended somebody that was sick. It was Nick for five years. But about the others, I didn't know. And he says, even as you've done it, and not done it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Oh, my God. Well, it tells you, I think, we're, we're um, how close is God to people? How close is he to you and to me if I do something to you, it's like doing it to God? How close is God? I and mean, that's, that's pretty doggone close. Makes you look at people a little bit differently. How loved are you by God if I do something to you? Well, what if somebody does something to your kids? I would rather have them do it to me than do it to my kid. Wouldn't you? Because you love your kid. If, I, don't, I don't mean to get like Jesus, but if, if you love your kid that much, imagine how much God loves you. Loves each of us. And especially if Jesus is going to say something like that. Anything else anybody find? Anybody want to share? You don't have to. I just didn't know if anything jumped out at you this week. Because if not... What about the stranger who invited me in? How do you invite strangers in? <laughs> ah, not American culture. You know. <laughs> well, and the interesting... I, I just... This, this bothers me. This is one of my bugaboos. Because in the church, we do charity. We don't love people. You stop and think about that. I don't invite a stranger into my house, but I can make sure they have underwear. I can make sure they have a coat. I can make sure they got clothes. But I don't really want them in my house. I can make sure that they have food. But, I want them. but that's not love. That's condescending. Well, it can be. I think, I think the journey from doing charitable works a condescending attitude is really small. And the reason it's a, a really small journey is because we don't understand it comes back to if you do this to the least of these. You, I don't think we understand how much God loves them. And if God loves them that much, then, then we're called to love them. So I say that not as somebody who's looking down his nose. That's a, that's a challenge. That is a challenge. Every time somebody walks in here, and needs some food, and wants their rent paid, wants their electric bill paid. It's always, it's always a challenge because there are some people who are just struggling as hard as you can, and there are people who will go to this church this week and the other church the next week, and they'll go down the road, and it's hard. It's it's hard to look at them and love them, and I've been taken to task for saying that very thing in this church. Loving people. Is really hard. It's really hard. But you got to give part of yourself. And that's right. And you're not sure they're gonna they're gonna respect that because you know Jesus said, "Don't throw your pearls before swine." So I'm not giving them a piece of myself. That's not what he meant, by the way, when he said, "Don't throw your pearls before swine." But it's exactly right. You have to give a piece of yourself. It's hard. It's really hard. 
And when you give a piece of yourself, you want to give it to somebody who's going to respect it and love it and return it. Maybe in better shape than you gave it to them. That's why y'all got married, wasn't it? So, right? So, anyway. If that's not why you got married, I don't want to know. <laughs> so, who has Bible with, Bible with them this evening? I need Luke 9, 28 through 36. And we are going to read through it together. Uh, Luke 9, 28 through 36. And we are going to make two columns as we read through this. We are going to read, make a column for what do you see. And we're going to make a column for all the things that you hear. So we're going to have two columns. some questions when we get done. You guys ready? We're going to get still working. You want to read a little bit? Sure. Uh, Luke 9, 28. Yes, sir. And read slowly. Because I'll probably stop you a couple times. And loudly, please. And, and loudly. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James with him and went up into a mountain to pray. All right, what's the first thing you see? What do you see? Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. What else do you see? Them going up to the mountain. You see a mountain. Is that everything? All right, keep this going to take a long time. Go ahead. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. Oh, what do you see? He's praying. Who's praying? Jesus. Jesus is praying. And what's the other thing you see? His face changed. Would we see the prayer or hear the prayer? Was he praying out loud? Point taken. You caught me. She's been doing it for 20 some odd years. She caught me. <laughs> well, back up to verse 28. I wanted to know what he had just said. And it's pretty rough. Oh, oh, where were you Sunday? Oh. Anybody remember from Sunday what he said? If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I don't think that's quite what he said. It's in the same neighborhood, though. Peter says. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then, or maybe that is what he says. I don't have it with me. It's not the translation I read. But. Oh, that's um, the, on the fourth point. I just said. Yeah. Well, that's what Peter says. And then Jesus says something that. Okay. That's, that's what he says eight days prior. So, this is commentary on that. Mm -hmm. Luke wants you to have that particular verse in your mind as you read this. So. Spend a little time setting that up Sunday. So, so Jesus is praying. Keep going. And his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Oh! Clorox. No! <laughs> his clothes are like lightning. So you need to do that. You gotta keep it. Reasonably is that. Keep going. Two men. Moses and Elijah appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. All right, what do you see? Moses and Elijah. What, what are they doing? Talking. They appeared and they're talking. There's tons you can do with this, but we're not going to do it all tonight. Okay. Keep going. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving, Jesus... <coughs> As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, 
And what for Elijah? They saw his glory. Whose glory? Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. Okay. We're almost there. Can we keep up? Yep. But of course, the end of that was he did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. So now what do you see? Cloud. Cloud. Keep going. A voice from the cloud a voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son whom I have chosen. Listen to him. What do you hear now? A voice. In the context, you know who the voice is, do you not? How do you know who the voice is? Father. He's the father. If that's the son, then this is the father. And he can, well, we'll, we'll get back to that. Keep going. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at that time what they had seen. The last thing you see is... Jesus alone. I mean, what's the body that they didn't tell anybody? At least I wonder. I have always wondered that. I have some sneaking suspicions. I have some sneaking suspicions, and we will get to them, I hope, at the end of this. I got 15 minutes to get you there. So, when you look at the stuff that you see, I'm hoping Blaine doesn't remember the conversation we had two weeks ago. When you look at the stuff that we see, are there other places in Scripture where you see the same thing? Not necessarily Peter, James, and John. A mountain. Is there any place that we see a mountain? The Mount of Olives. No. Uh, uh, oh well, well, that's okay. It's a, it's, it's a. I, I would not. I would suggest he's not. And the reason I would not suggest, that, I would suggest that he's not about the mountain, the mountain is because what comes next? You see, their clothes are like lightning. Their clothes are are white. Transfiguration, lightning. Mount of Transfiguration, hmm? the Mount of Transfiguration. That's where we are. That's where this text is. Okay. So the question is, is there someplace else in Scripture where you have a mountain, you have lightning, you have people glowing, you have people coming down the mountain alone? Huh? Moses. Moses. Let's think about Moses. Moses goes up on the mountain, right? Moses regularly, we call that the Shekinah, right? Moses winds up shining like the noonday sun a couple of times. Every time the Spirit of the Lord descends on the tent of meeting and talks to Moses, he looks like what? Just like this. The presence of the Holy Spirit. So then you have Moses, and you have Elijah, and you have Jesus, all three of them standing there speaking. Where was the last place you saw three people speaking, and you weren't quite sure who the other two were? Am I going to have to sing it? Yes, the fiery furnace. Fire furnace, okay. And the cloud. Where do you see the cloud? On the mountain? You're back to Moses, right? You're back to Moses. Most of the imagery, I cannot sit here and, and, and I can't draw a straight line from the text, the words that Luke uses, 
to the Old Testament. But boy, if I look at this, I'm not sure how you look at this and you don't see what's the story, what's the big long, the short word. Second book of the Bible. Exodus. I'm not sure how you fail to see the Exodus in the background of this story. I don't know how you do it. Smart, far smarter people than I do, I am, will take you there. So what you see in the background is the story of Exodus. So what do you hear? What do you hear? You hear Jesus praying. You hear Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus about the departure. You see, Peter wants to make shelters. If I said that the word could also be translated out tabernacle, what might you think? You might not think anything. There's a feast, isn't there? In the Old Testament, isn't there a feast of tabernacles? And the feast of the tabernacle celebrates what? Everybody's got to leave their house and pitch a tent. Uh, if they were living now, they all go pitch a tent or put their trailer, and they would live at the campsite for the festival to remind them of what? Why do you leave your house and go build a little shanty somewhere and live outside your house for the festival? What's it remind you of? Uh, leaving Egypt. Leaving Egypt. Leaving Egypt. And returning to the, to the promised land. Okay. Moses is Moses. Elijah is Elijah. So, here's the question. And J.D. would be proud to have an idea like this, right? Is seeing enough? Is seeing enough? I just suggest to you that this story is not for you, and it's not for Jesus, and it's not for Moses, and it's not for Elijah. This story is here to communicate something to Peter, James, and John, which makes this really unusual. Because a lot of times the stories are geared at you and I as disciples. This story almost assumes that you and I have already read the story and we know how it ends and we know how everything's going to play out and we, we know some things that Peter, James, and John don't know. So the story is for Peter, James, and John. And the question I want to ask is seeing enough. This is a trick question. If seeing were enough, I wouldn't have put a second column. Okay? Seeing is not enough. We have to hear. And what is it God says? You hear God. That's the very last thing that happens, right? You hear God, Jesus comes down the mountain. You hear God and he says, this is my son, my chosen. Listen, what was the verse we were supposed to keep in the back of our minds? Pam? Um, Come sleep is at the foot of God. Yeah. And listen to I'll take up, take up the, the one after Peter's confession. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And then you read the verse that came right after that. I'm sorry. That's an unfair thing to do to you. Are you talking about Jesus being strictly warned him not to tell anything? No, no, it just... Um, Comes right before. Uh, it's okay. Let me try this verse. you say that I am? It's after that. It's after Peter's confession. Oh, the Christ is Peter answered. Christ and then and then God. Jesus says after Peter answers. He says a lot of things here. He does. But essentially what he's saying is take up my cross. You some Oh yeah, right. if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. That if you're gonna if I'm the Christ, the Son of the Living God. It's about suffering, and you have to take up your cross, and you have to follow. <clears throat> and what 
the boy says, is this is my son, this is my chosen one. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to that verse. The whole story I want to suggest to you is cast as seeing but not understanding. Um, followed by seeing and understanding, which is if you see this as the exodus, as a new exodus, how might it work with the mission statement of Jesus expressed in the Gospels of 418, which you also read to us? Um, a version of that. It's, it's not, it, what you read to us was not the mission statement, but it was a, a what I would consider a reiteration. Um, when you have done it to one of the least of me, when you have done it to the least of these, you have done it to me. So, if you're going to it's when he, it's the word he sends to John the Baptist. Tell him this is what you see. And it's a quote. It's a quote from Deuteronomy. Um, well, anyway. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because of this he has anointed me to proclaim the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim deliverance to the captives, and new sight to the blind, to set at liberty those having been crushed. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. If Exodus is freedom from slavery, what's the transfiguration going to look like? Sin. Of all kinds, A to Z. Big sins, little sins, starving people sins, people going without food and water sins, people who have been broken and hurt sins, all kinds of sins, absolutely everything. In the story in Exodus, the people come out of slavery. In the story of Jesus, the people are about to come out of slavery. And the people don't come out of slavery unless you go to the cross. Somebody has to free them. And the price for their freedom is the cross. And you get that all set up in the Mount of Transfiguration story. Is that not the most amazing thing? I had never looked at it like, quite like that before. I've always been trying to figure out what was the transfiguration. It never occurred to me in 35 years of doing this that this was a setup. This was setting you up for the journey to the cross. My suspicion is that Matthew will do something similar in a slightly different way. Any questions? Did I lose you? Confuse you? Talked about that. In Luke's Gospel, I thought this was kind of interesting. Um, When Jesus asks, who, who, do, who do the crowds say that I am? And the crowds will say, Elijah! When we get to the end of this story, they want to know, who is this guy coming into Jerusalem on a donkey? Elijah! And my question to you is, are the crowds right? Are the crowds right? Is Jesus Elijah? And how do you know he's not? Very simple, actually. You know he's not because Jesus, Elijah, and Moses all show up in this scene and are talking to each other. So unless Jesus is talking to himself and he has multiple personalities, he's not Elijah. He's not. So the crowds, pay attention, are going to get this wrong right up until the very end. And what we are hoping is that the disciples get it right. But we're a little doubtful, aren't we? They really should have gotten it right because they're steeped in their the Jewish culture. We, we're not. No! <laughs> Nothing really in the Old Testament, but still. They were walking with the guy for three years. Okay. But I'm here to tell you we don't always get it right either. How long have we been walking? 
But see, that's the thing. It's about walking. <coughs> you gonna say something? The other thing was, is if you were shooting a movie, there would be two camera angles in this in this scene. Anybody know what the two camera angles would be? You'd be looking at things from um, from the disciples' perspective and from God's perspective. And on the one hand, you're seeing things as Peter, James, and John see them. And then on the other hand, you are seeing things as God sees them and wants you to see them. So, um, and that's the other interesting thing about this story. Um, I can ask this question, and you can answer this question. I won't barely set it up for you. Who speaks for God? When you get done with this story, who speaks for God? There's only one person. What does it say at the very end? What's the last thing God says in this story? Listen. Listen to him. What's, what's God say at the very end of the story, Sue? I just yeah, listen, I to <coughs> listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. Who speaks for God? God. Jesus. Mm. And that's it. That's it. Moses doesn't speak for God. Elijah doesn't speak for God. Jesus speaks for God because he's chosen. Only one person speaks for God. So, that's where we're headed. So here's my quandary for next week. Are we, can I go on to my quandary for next week? J.D. is going to start right after this, um, like 46 to 48, and Jesus is going to set a little child in front of him, and you all know the story. And he's going to do some stuff that I don't think he has a whole lot to do with setting a little child in front of him, but it's good stuff, so we'll, we'll listen anyway. The other option is to go to where the sermon is Sunday, which is uh, ask, seek, and knock. And Jesus is model for prayer. I don't know if we should do that, though, because I had given my wife all kinds of hints today over lunch about that. So I don't know if she... I was talking to her about the sermon Sunday, so... But you'll have the sermon Sunday, so you'll have, some, you'll have that thing to do. So my question is, I'm in a quandary whether we... Uh, do the text that the JD is going to begin with, but not spend a whole lot of time with the study, or we work with the text from the sermon, which is, you know, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. And the passage is on either side of that, you know, or a couple of parables on either side. What would you prefer to do? If we skip his session, is it going to be weird to go back no, we'll, we'll do, and we'll pick do, up? No, we will do. We have to do his session because he starts something next week and then he will finish it up in week three. So we're, we're, we'll watch it, and it's valuable because what he's going to do next week is he's going to explain to you about this mountain valley thing that he's done. It's it's his thing. Okay, the mountain valley thing is his thing. He's doing it here. He's doing it with us as we go through Philippians with him in the morning. Um, and I guess he's already done it with the Asbury community when he was doing chapel with them. So this is his thing. So we should, we should be exposed to his thing. I think it's a good thing. I think I can make it tie in. We're putting a little child in front of him. So maybe that's the direction we'll go. Unless you... I can't picture what the alternatives are. Well, that's just that's just it. I'm not exactly sure at this point, but I'm, I, I I think I can make make the one set of scriptures work. And if we if we choose the text for Sunday, then JD does his thing, and then we do something totally different after we listen to him. 
and talk about him a little bit. So you sort of divide up and you have a half hour with the video and a half hour with the text. Or I can try and tie little child in his mountains and valleys, which I think I can. So it doesn't move us very far down the path, but that's all. So what I'm sure, can we, should we do the little child thing? It doesn't matter to me. Doesn't matter to any of you. I'm curious about it now. <laughs> what he's going to do with a little child. All right. Well, then that's what we will do next week. So, <laughs> Sorry, but um, no, that's well. If you don't care, if they don't care, and you and I kind of think that maybe well, we're going to go. We'll, we'll head in that general direction. If I find out by Tuesday that it just isn't working, I'll switch gears. Um, but I'll start there and see what I can see what I can do. So for next week, it is nine. I think it's 46 through 48. It'll be, they come down the mountain. They struggle because the disciples are all sitting down there and it's like, well, I can't heal them. Can you heal them? I can't heal them. Well, I tried this. You know, they, they can't heal them. And Jesus goes, oh, how long am I going to be with this wicked and perverse generation? And you go down a little bit and then he sets a, a child in front of them. So, um, so that's, I, I think, I mean, I can find it. Oh, I can't. It's there. So that's that's where we will be next week. But you, you did okay not having the text for this week, right? You, you prepare a little different, I'm assuming people have it down. But I think it's 946 through 48 is what it is. So, anyway, are we good? All right. We will say good evening. And maybe we'll have some different sound next week. I don't know. We'll see. Okay. Okay. All right.